The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and as ever, I'm really pleased to be with you and sharing uh, the scriptures and particularly perhaps for this vocation Sunday that's coming up, the Good Shepherd Sunday. That reminds us to ask ourselves, what do we mean by vocation? Unfortunately, we always immediately think of priests, monks, sisters, deacons. I hope we think of deacons as well uh, these days. Um, but that isn't just what vocation, what Vocation Sunday is about. It's a sense of, for each one of us, the calling. What is God's call in our lives? What is God calling us to do, to be, how are we to witness? Every one of us has a sacred calling, every one of us. And we work it out in different ways, according to the kind of people we are, according to the work we're doing, according to our lifestyle. We, we work it out in different ways. But there's not one of us who is not uniquely called by God. By the God who is love and you are called, I am called to express in our own unique way the love that God is for the world. So as we think of vocation, we think of that, that, that wonderful song, uh, is it the second? I think it's the second song of the suffering servant, second or third song of the suffering servant. It says, morning by morning, you awaken my ear and you give me a servant's tongue. The good shepherd, one who lays down his life so that we may have life in all its fullness. Life in all its fullness. And you know, life in all its fullness is so different from the good life. The good life of uh, having my foreign holidays, being able to go out to restaurants, have plenty of money to spend on clothes. That's not the good life. The good life is when I seek to live always by love. That's the good life. That's the new life of Christ. That's the new creation that we are becoming as we listen to his voice, as we follow closely by him. So in this gospel, we have, first of all, who are we? Yes, we are the sheep. We are the sheep called to listen to his voice, stay close to him, be disciples who really follow. Too often we've thought that Christianity was about keeping the rules, saying our prayers, receiving the sacraments, and trying not to do anything too bad. And it isn't, sisters and brothers. What Christianity is, being a faithful disciple, modeling our lives on Christ Jesus. In, and in modeling our lives in Christ Jesus, we need time for prayer. We need to be with the rest of the flock, the community. We need to be celebrating Eucharist. We need to let Christ feed us and nourish us with word and with sacrament. All so that we grow in love. In the love that expresses and witnesses to the shepherd. He tells us very clearly. He says, I know my own and my own know me. And there are other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Now he was, of course, talking to his, his uh, co-religionists, Jewish people. So he was here saying, ah, it, this, it, there's no cliques. As St. Peter said, when he met Cornelius, the centurion, the Acts of the Apostles, I have discovered that God has no favorites. Actually, and for someone schooled in the Jewish tradition of the chosen people, told to keep away from Gentiles, to preserve their faith, that was a startling thing for him to say, God has no favorites. And God doesn't. Another way of putting it is, everyone is God's favorite. Every single person. There is no one who is not the flock of Christ. Most people don't know they are. 
but no one is not beloved of God, cared for by Christ. He died on the cross, laying down his life as a good shepherd for the whole of humanity. As I think I may have said before here, I believe quite passionately that Jesus did not come to set up a religion called Christianity. Jesus came to liberate the power of divinely touched humanity. And as drawn through baptism into the new creation, into the body of Christ, we are called to witness before the rest of the world that it is possible for us all to be brothers and sisters. It's possible for us to live at peace with each other. It's possible for us to forgive each other. It's possible for us to love with courage and heroism each other. It's possible for us to build a world where no one is exploited, where all are equal, all can sit equally at the beautiful banquet of our earth. So every time we see on our screens a malnourished child, every time we see on our screens um, villages and children who can't get fresh water, clean water, that's an assault to us. Let's feel it as an assault because we should be responding as the shepherd does and saying we cannot tolerate this any longer. We have to do something to change. And that's why we need structural change in our world. And as the shepherd community of the church, we are called to work towards that structural change. One of the strong developments in modern moral theology has been the recognition that sin is primarily structural sin. The sin that's not necessarily an individual's responsibility, but is the fruit of um, oppressive structures that we've allowed to build up in our world. And sadly, the Christian West and North have, have actually created those, that's one of the great ironies of history, have actually created those sinful structures. That's why we are the wealthiest part of the world. And we're the wealthiest part of the world because we've exploited other areas and reduced them to poverty. And you just need to look at history and the history of economics and the economic systems we've produced. And Pope Francis, of course, is very sensitive to this. And in his latest encyclical, when both in both Laudato Si on climate change and also um, the um, of Tutti on a, so new, a new pattern of social relationships, both locally and globally, he addresses these issues, that we've created a technocratic economic model of humanity. That's what Pope Leo XIII criticized in communism, Marxism in the 19th century, that it was reducing the human person to an economic unit that's what capitalism does. It reduces the person to an economic unit. No. We have inherent value and worth. And sadly, our world doesn't respect that. So often our world doesn't respect And we've created systems. That's why, for instance, like fair trade is trying to recapture the values of the inherent the inherent worth of each person's labor and each person and their rights to proper remuneration. That's why the slave economy is such an affront to God, such a blasphemy against the human person, this exploitation. Now, we are all called together to build the church as the shepherd community that is willing to suffer 
like our shepherd suffered in order to change this world. Not necessarily to convert it all to being good, good, holy Catholics who come to church and receive the sacraments. But actually, we are called to be the yeast in the dough. We're called to be the city which lights a light on a hilltop that can be seen, that gives witness. I don't think it was ever Jesus' intention that everybody should become Christians and disciples. It is God's design that the community gathered around and centered on Christ witnesses that the world can be different and then engages in making that world different, more just and more humane. And I don't want to finish without just commenting on that very beautiful second reading in today's Mass. Think of the love the Father has lavished on us. Lavished. What a strong word. Poured out. Overflowing. Just nothing he wouldn't give us. By letting us to be called God's children. And that's what we are. We are already beloved children of the Father. As St. Paul would say, heirs to the Father, co-heirs with Christ. I find that one of the most mind-blowing statements in the New Testament. Heirs of the, in other words, the Father loves us like he loves his son Jesus. As he has loved the eternal word from before all time, that's the love he has for you and for me. And then he goes on to say, um, but what we're going to be in the future, we don't know. This is the season of resurrection. But what's resurrection? Well, we grope and to try and grasp just a little of what it might be. But in the end, we don't know. We don't know what it is to have a resurrected body. What we do know, all we know is that we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. So death becomes the birth passage into the fullness of our lives, the fullness of who we are. Resurrection has already begun in us, but it's not complete in us. But when we see God face to face, that gaze of love transforms us and the divine nature of our humanity emerges, be seen, overwhelms. We become the divine nature of our humanity. And that's what the theologians, both of East and West, down through the Christian centuries, have described as divinization. Divinization. The eternal word empties himself to come into our humanity and our world in order to raise our humanity into the divine place. That's why he says, you will sit, I will share my throne with you. He shares his identity. He's not possessive of being a son of God. He shares that with all of us. That is the most amazing reading. That's why it's quite often used at funerals, because it tells us that while we may not know what resurrection looks like, we may not have, have any real idea what heaven is going to be like. What we do know is that when we are gazed upon by the eternal love that is God, we are transformed into eternal love. I'm going to finish there. I want to share with you a prayer, an Easter prayer, by one of the great Brazilian bishops, who's also a great poet and mystic, Bishop Pedro uh, Casal da Liga, forgive my poor Spanish, <laughs> uh, sorry, Portuguese. 
But this is this prayer that comes right out. He's one of the great liberation bishops of Brazil, along with Helder Camara. And he was a friend of, of the martyred Oscar Romero. And this is the prayer. Alleluia, alleluia. Speak, Jesus, word of God. It is your turn to speak, alleluia. Brother who speaks truth to his brothers and sisters, give us your new freedom. Free from profit and from fear, we will live in gospel. We will shout in gospel, alleluia, alleluia. No power will silence us. Alleluia, alleluia. Against the orders of hate, you bring us the law of love. In the face of so many lies, you are the truth out loud. Amidst so much news of death, you have the word of life. After so many false promises, frustrated hopes, you have, Lord Jesus, the last word. And we have put all our trust in you. Alleluia, alleluia. Your truth will set us free. Alleluia, alleluia. And finally, O God of light, and life of love ever renewed proclaiming yes to all that jesus is and all that he said and did and suffered we give you praise and glory for you burst the gates of hell you destroy sin and death you render the powers helpless to harm you give your people eternal life you bring all humanity from death to life you gladden our hearts, you give us joy. Risen Christ, come in your victorious power. Affirm in us the goodness of God. Give us new life. Reconcile us in peace. Strengthen us in the assurance of final triumph. Make us faithful in witness. Fulfill in us your promises. And may the blessing, peace and healing of our shepherd God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit can burn upon us all and upon all our world, now and always. Amen. Sisters and brothers, thank you and go in peace to be the shepherd Christ to his world. Thanks be to God. The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs>